we are leaning in as a team at my agency into forward thinking mindset. And the difference between being a short term kind of finite thinker versus a long term forward infinite thinker. I think that that mindset is really the key. You guys, I have been working on something for the last six months that has been such a giant project, but I'm so proud of it. I'm excited to announce that I've just released my book. It's called Touch Points, and it's the Destination Marketer's Guide to Brand Evaluation and Enhancement. And it is a comprehensive guide for destinations to look at their brand, evaluate what you've done, and make a very clear and detailed plan of action of how to fix it. And it's... Look, I'm biased, right? Because I wrote it, but I think it's so good. I think it's a great guide and I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. And I wanted to tell you guys about it. It's available on Amazon. Search Touch Points by Adam Stoker and you'll be able to get that book for your destination. And I think it's going to be, especially for for anyone that is trying to look at their brand holistically, this is the book for you. So check it out. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. Excited, as always, to be with you today. Uh, We've got a great guest, a great show for you. We actually are pulling in someone from another podcast in the industry. We've done that before. Now we've got a new guest that I think you're really going to enjoy what she has to say. Her name is Nicole Mahoney, and she is from Break the Ice Media. And they're an agency out of Rochester, New York, that focuses on tourism. But then she also has a great podcast, probably the podcast in the industry that's been around the longest. uh, And it's called Destination on the Left. I bet many of you have heard it. But Nicole, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm I'm thrilled that you're joining us, and and you know you guys have such a great show over there. And you and I yesterday recorded a, a, an episode with me appearing on your podcast, and I think it's so great that we get to kind of cross pollinate our audiences a little bit. And while our shows are are both a little bit different, I think they're both critical to helping people navigate the challenges that come along with the tourism industry. And and I I really am glad we get to do this. I think it's great. Absolutely, I I couldn't agree more. And um. I'm uh, happy to share with your audience and the interview that we did yesterday. I can't wait for that one to come out because my audience is going to learn so much from you. And hopefully if they don't already listen to this great podcast, they'll become subscribers too. Well, we need to have everybody subscribe to both, I think. I, I, it, there's there's value on both sides. So uh, th- thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you. We have a couple of questions. As you know, you've listened to the show that, that we like to ask everybody just to kind of get the get the juices flowing here on the interview. So first of all, I want to ask you, what is your dream destination? Nicole, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? Yeah, so I have lots. Um, but the one that I'm uh, passionate about at the moment just so happens to be a project that we're working on. And so the more I work on this project, the more I want to go there. And that is uh, Victoria Falls, in the Kaza region of East Africa. Just looks phenomenal. Yes. Can't wait to see it in person. (laughs) Okay. And you're working on a project for them right now. We are. It's actually um, a pro bono project. I will say that out loud right here on your show. Um, But we were pulled in on a project because COVID-19 has hit that region of the world pretty hard, um, just as it has all around the world. And yeah. the director of the Victoria Falls Regional Tourism Council reached out to us to ask us if we could help them plan a virtual trade show uh, for their suppliers from that region to, to keep them connected. Uh, because when travel does rebound, they want to make sure they have those relationships built and, and those connections made. Got it. Got it. Well, but you haven't visited yet. No, though. I have not, but I'm learning all about it. And oh. I don't know if this happens to you, but the more <laughs> you work with different destinations, I mean, I could fill probably every week of the year with, you know, all of these destinations that we get to work with and learn about um, being in the travel and tourism industry. So itching to go somewhere for sure, especially right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's incredibly fun, like you said, to work on all these tourism destinations around the world. But then the the challenge is that it's just torture sometimes because you want to you want to go visit and there's there's not enough 
you know, weeks in the year to be able to visit all these places. Uh, do you have it on your roadmap to actually go visit Victoria Falls? It's uh, not on my roadmap yet, but I hope that it will be within the next couple of years, especially after we get out of this recovery and and uh, and move into you know the new normal. Uh, definitely would like to see that in person and and meet the folks there who I've met and become friends with over Zoom. But I'd love to see them in person for sure. Great. great. Okay. Well, we want to hear after you visit Victoria Falls. We want to hear how it goes. Absolutely. Well, okay, and and this is always a difficult question for people in the industry because you're like, oh man, are, are my clients going to be sad if I don't mention them or whatever? So let's just take all the constraints off. I want to know your favorite trip you've ever been on. Okay, well, I do have actually two that I'll mention, and they are not clients. So, but maybe they could be someday. That would be awesome. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but the uh, first one is Anna Maria Island, which is a favorite girlfriend getaway for me and my girlfriends, and great memories there. And we just love the laid back uh, island feel. Uh, and it's in and where Florida, is that in Florida? Okay. In the Sarasota area, Anna Maria Island. It's just fantastic. We'll love it there. And our favorite family vacation is Maine. Uh, my kids every year are, you know, just anxious to know when are we going to Maine. And uh, as a matter of fact, when we skip a year, they're really disappointed. <laughs> so we love our Maine, and we're usually on the coast of Maine. We've we've gone all up and down the coast of Maine and uh, stayed in many of the communities along the seaway there. So that would be my second favorite. So it depends on the vacation I'm taking. <laughs> yeah. And, and who's going with you, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Bill Geist also said the coast of Maine was one of his very favorite trips when he came on. And it sounds like a pretty amazing place. Uh, tell me a couple of the activities that you like to do along the coast. Well, first of all, the fresh lobster. So we love to go to, depending on the community, a lot of them have uh, the lobster boats coming in at a certain hour and you can go down and buy fresh lobster right off the boat. That is just an amazing experience. And then of course it's really good food. Um, and then the, the, the beaches and the hiking, um, we went to a blueberry festival. It's just a really kind of not overcrowded, relaxed kind of vacation. Um, okay. Beautiful, you know, beautiful nature. We haven't seen a moose yet, and one of my daughters is just, you know, dying to see a moose. I have friends in Maine. They see moose all the time, but we have not yet, so that's on the bucket list. One of these times, we want to okay. catch a moose, hopefully. <laughs> not catch, literally. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say catch one. That's a whole new no, type of vacation. Catch, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's catch one on camera, right? That's right, on camera. <laughs> Well, good stuff. Good stuff. Well, tell me a little bit about you, Nicole, uh, and you know a little bit about your background and how you ended up in tourism. All right. So um, it's an interesting path. I actually date my interest in tourism back to working for my father and my family-owned business, the business he owned, which was a retail electronics store. And the reason why I, I go all the way back to that is because uh, one of the promotions that we did and I organized for him annually was this car stereo competition. Yes, there is such a thing. And there's official judging and you work your way up to the nationals. It's a pretty big deal. And so we used to host <laughs> these in his parking lot and we would draw about 5,000 people from all over the Northeast. And that was my first kind of taste of, oh, people from outside of the area actually come here you know, to where we are for different reasons, in this case, for a car stereo competition. Uh -huh. um, so that was kind of my first taste of it. And then from there, uh, I left the family business and my my uh, first job outside of the family was uh, working on a project in the 90s, um, building a new baseball, AAA baseball stadium in downtown Rochester. And that really opened my eyes up to, you know, sports and what a, what a stadium can mean to a downtown, um, how you use that kind of venue for other types of events, how you draw in people. And that was actually my first introduction to the CVB in our area, which is Visit Rochester. And I uh, became very active with them uh, representing the baseball stadium. Uh, after the baseball stadium, I ran one of our largest festivals. It, 
called the Lilac Festival. It's a 10 day event that happens every year, except this year it didn't happen. Um, but uh, uh, ran that for several years. And then when I started on my entrepreneurial journey, um, started doing uh, freelance work and marketing work for um, all types of businesses. But one central theme came back every time is they all relied on tourism in one way or another, whether it was, you know, the festival that I mentioned or the baseball stadium or our downtown business improvement district and all those small retailers and restaurants um, that rely on those visitors. And so my passion just kind of built over time, I think, from from starting as, you know, in a small family owned business and and working my way, you know, through these different experiences. And so by the time I launched my own agency, which was about 10 years ago, we decided that we were going to really niche and focus in on travel and tourism in particular. Got it. So from car stereo competitions to tourism. That is not your normal journey into tourism. I like it. That's right. And, it's fine. And so tell me how often, uh, as, as you're in tour, how often do you think back to that? Cause I, I do this sometimes thinking, oh my gosh, this, this one little event kind of changed the course, you know? So, so how often do you kind of reflect on what led you here to tourism? Yeah. I mean, it does come up quite a bit, whether, you know, whether it's because I host a show like you do, right. And constantly talking to people about their own journey. So, you know, as you talk to others about their journeys, you're often, you know, reflect on your own. Um, But also the, you know, the older I get, the more experiences that we have, it just becomes so clear kind of how the building blocks happen and how you pull on different experiences all the time. And and you never know when you're actually going to need to lean on something that you may have learned, you know, 20 plus years ago. And frankly, the time that we're in right now with this pandemic, think about all of the all of those experiences in different crises that have happened in our lifetimes that we're leaning on right now, right, as we're navigating through this crisis. So um, I think it comes up, you know, it comes out quite a bit. Well, I love that you went that direction with your answer, because I really do feel like one of the benefits of of experience, right, is that as you go through challenging things, they feel awful. They feel hard in the moment. And I think all of us at different times during this coronavirus pandemic have felt awful or challenging or challenged. And the the great thing about it is that 10 years down the road, as you're navigating a different problem or challenge, this exact experience may be what you need to, to solve the problem, right? And, and I'm sure you've seen that throughout your career. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I think when this crisis started, it was scary and it still is right. Uncertain and, and a little scary, but, um, I didn't feel as, um, fearful, I guess, as maybe I did right at, right when 9-11 happened or, um, I I had a, I've had some personal experiences. Um, one of my daughters had a, had a health issue when she was born. So the first five years of her life were very stressful. And so even for those personal crises that we go through, you grow so much. And so this crisis came and I thought to myself, this is not fun. This is not what I choose, (laughs) but I know I can get to the other side. Why? Because I've done it before. Right. And we've done it before. So um, I think it just really helps with perspective as you approach it. Um, having those past experiences. Well, and and we'll dive a little bit more into the coronavirus later in the show, but we may come back to perspective because I really do feel like the way you approach a crisis or a challenge has so much to do with how you come out on the other side. And and I'll want to get to that. But before we do, tell me a little bit about the Destination on the Left podcast. Like I said earlier, it's, it's one of the longest running podcasts in the tourism industry, if not the longest, and just would love to hear the history of that of that show. Yeah, I, I want to tell you this story about, let's see, well, first of all, I launched Destination on the Left in 2016, but I think it was maybe 2013 um, when I convinced a gentleman in our region who had an internet radio show. This is like before podcasts were really big. And it was called the CEO Hour. And he would interview CEOs from all over 
uh, the region um, every week on his show. And I got to know him and I said to him, you know, you really should think about interviewing the CEOs of our destination marketing organizations. They're often overlooked as, you know, economic engines. They're often not thought of in terms of uh, employment generators, right? You know, and, and not as respected necessarily as that CEO of that manufacturing company that you might have interviewed. But I right. made a case for it and I convinced him to interview our Visit Rochester, uh, which is where I'm located, CEO, and the Visit Syracuse uh, CEO, which is about an hour east of Rochester, on one of his shows. And I co hosted with him. And it was great. I was so excited. I thought, this is fantastic. We really could show off what the tourism industry can do and how, you know, what leaders these CEOs are. And I was working with this gentleman trying to figure out how to launch a tourism CEO hour, if you will. Um, And it was just too costly. The way he was producing and distributing his internet radio show was too expensive for me to get involved in at the time. Fast forward a few years. And I was invited to be a guest on the podcast. And um, after being the guest on the podcast, I I said to that podcast host, geez, I've got this idea for this show. And he said, whoa, that's a really good idea. And um, I thought, great. So I dove in and basically Destination on the Left was born. So it was this gem of an idea that I've had for years and years, but couldn't really see a way to... Uh, execute on it until podcasts became a lot easier, right, to produce and distribute. Um, And that was in 2016. And now uh, just this week, we published our uh, episode 181. And the goal of Destination on the Left, it's a couple of things. First of all, people ask me, why do you call it Destination on the Left? When my team and I were brainstorming a name, we recognized that most travel is done by car and driving. And uh-huh. most of our clients, if not all of them, are drive to destinations versus fly. And so we just kind of were brainstorming and came up with, you know, when your GPS tells you you've arrived, it'll say, you know, you've arrived, your destination's on the left or whatever. So that was sort of how we came up with the idea. Um, but we wanted it to be not just about destination marketing, but about the whole tourism ecosystem. So my guests are destination marketers, but also museums, uh, restaurants, um, uh, tour operators, agencies who work, you know, in the tourism industry, researchers. I try to really explore all aspects of it. Um, For example, this week's episode is a gentleman who is in the restaurant industry, and he's actually somebody that I, I know through my network who um, helps with surplus inventory for restaurants. So he's on like the facility operations side. It wouldn't be somebody you would think of to interview for a tourism podcast, but I wanted yeah. to know what was going on in the restaurant industry as a result of this crisis. And I thought who better to ask than somebody who is seeing restaurant closures and talking to restaurant owners and really understanding, you know, what's going on. Um, and so I invited him to be a guest and it's a fantastic episode. I learned a lot from him and, and that's this week. So it's just one example of. Yeah, really I'm excited we, for that one. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, so so that that's really that's the story. And uh, it was, like I said, this idea that I had uh, that I pitched to a, a gentleman who had his own Internet uh, radio show and then evolved into my own podcast several years later. How cool. How cool. And when you and I were talking yesterday, I mean, you told me the number of episodes and it's what's what was it like 150? Remind me. 181 is what we just published. 181. Wow. And as somebody that that goes through the creation and publishing of of (laughs) podcast episodes, I mean, 181 episodes is a lot of work. Congratulations. Yeah, it's a commitment. And congratulations to you. You just made it past a year. You probably know this, but most podcasts don't make it. Um, I think the number was five episodes or eight episodes. And then a lot of people abandon them after that. So um, well, and and you and I can see why, right? <laughs> because, <laughs> because it is a lot of work, but it's so much fun. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, and now I can't imagine not having it, honestly. I mean, I've been doing it for so long. It's, uh, you know, 
if I didn't have it, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> well, you get to meet so many amazing people and, and so many different perspectives on the tourism industry. And, and like you said, I mean, you're, you're talking to somebody that, that uh, handles the restaurant side of the business and, and bringing a perspective that really a lot of destination marketers may not have heard before. And, you know, the thing I love about it is I just learn so much. Like, I don't, I don't know where my learning would come from if I didn't bring so many smart people on the show. <laughs> I agree. Absolutely. Same here. <laughs> Great. And, and you also own an advertising agency. And I want you to tell me a, a, about the agency and kind of your role there and, and where your specialties are. Yeah. So we just celebrated 10 years uh, last October. And wow. Congrats. Thank you. Also, not no small task, right, to make it 10 years. Um, we're <laughs> right. aiming to do another 10. COVID's not going to slow us down. <laughs> uh, but uh, the agency is as I mentioned, focused on travel and tourism. We work in all aspects of it. So we work with destinations, museums, um, wine trails, wineries, breweries, and we are grounded in strategy. So everything that we do starts with helping our clients identify their goals. Um, And it doesn't necessarily have to be just their marketing goals, really understanding what their business goals are. Uh, so that then we can tie their marketing plans and their marketing strategy and their tactics back to those goals. Um, the tactics that we specialize in are, you know, travel PR, digital strategies. Um, we do travel trade marketing. Uh, we're kind of on both sides of travel trade. We're out repping clients at shows. You might see some of my team members there. Or we're working with tour and travel companies, helping them uh, to market direct to consumer. So we work on um, all sides again. And we also provide association management um, services to travel and tourism organizations. It wasn't something I set out to do, but it's one of those things that just evolved. And I actually have two uh, members of my team who are executive directors for other organizations that we then provide uh, the executive director, and then we also provide the support. And those would be organizations that do tourism marketing. Uh, one is the Finger Lakes Regional Tourism Council, which is the 14 county, re- county region where where my office is. And the other is Travel Alliance Partners, which is a uh, association that's owned by 28 uh, tour operators from across North America. And so those are really unique relationships because we run the operations side of the organization as well as the marketing side. And it just brings us that much deeper into the industry. Yeah, but, you know, running the operations side, you almost get the visibility into things that sometimes it's hard to get access to as an agency. My, My guess would be that in those relationships, you're able to look at things so much more holistically because you can see farther up the chain of conversation, right? Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point because uh, as I'm sure you can relate to as an agency, you know, when you're brought in and you can be that partner that's at the table for those business conversations and not just a vendor that's here to execute on a tactic, you can be so much more, so much more strategic and serve the client so much better, right? If you're deeper right. into those conversations. Um, so, and, totally. and another thing that that we really specialize in or we've gotten really good at is what I call multi-stakeholder programs. And I'm a big supporter of collaboration because I think it's the way, you know, that tourism, uh, the tourism ecosystem is successful through collaboration. And I also think it's a way out of this COVID-19 is going to be through collaboration. And one of the yes. things that we do is we work with, when I look at our client roster, the majority of them are collaborations. For example, we have a haunted history trail program, which has 89 stops across New York state that are part of this collaborative program. They all pay in and we run this program for them. Uh, We have uh, Discover Central Massachusetts, which is 34 communities and five counties in Massachusetts that, you know, partnered together to market um, the Travel Alliance partners that I mentioned. Uh, We run a Canadian PR co-op with 15 New York State partners, all interested in the Canadian market. So they pool their funds 
and we do um, travel PR for them in the Canadian market. So just really understanding how to work those multi-stakeholder programs, understanding what everyone brings to the table, understanding everyone's interests and trying to find the, you know, the commonality and pull all that together is another thing that, that we do uh, really, really well. Yeah, I love the word that you used for it yesterday when we talked, and that was co-opetition. <laughs> that, yes. that it's it's collaboration, but we're still competing a little bit, so it's co-opetition. I thought it was just such a such a good mashup of those words there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that's definitely a favorite term of mine, and we talk about it on my podcast all the time. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, but you're right when you say that that collaboration is going to be what gets a lot of these destinations out of the muck of the challenges that they're dealing with in the coronavirus situation. And we talked about coronavirus a little bit earlier, but I wanted to, and really I, I want to, now that you, you've brought up collaboration and co-opetition, I'd love to hear who you feel like in the industry is doing that very well right now in the midst of this crisis. Yeah, there are a few examples that uh, I had thought about because for your listeners to know, you did give me these questions in advance, so I, am, I did have a few <laughs> minutes to uh, to think about them. Um, but one in particular is the New York State Brewers Association. Um, they have been so creative in supporting the beer industry in New York State. Uh, they have about 450 members in the state, and they very quickly and very early into this launched into these virtual tasting events uh, that they were hosting at a different brewery. Uh, I believe it was on Wednesdays, but it was on a regularly scheduled day of the week and time of the week. And so they gave this opportunity to their breweries to continue to be able to reach you know, the consumer as well as a way for the organization to serve you know, to serve the industry. But then the really cool thing that they did after the success of these regular happy hours, if you will, is they created this virtual craft beer tasting experience. And basically it was an online tasting experience. They had four 90 minute tasting sessions. Each one had a different brewery. And then for each session, uh, the, the folks who bought tickets received two uh, craft beers from that particular brewery shipped directly to their house. And then they were in this exclusive Zoom call with the brewers and the owners um, from that brewery. And what they did is they picked a day. Oh, I love yeah, that. They picked a Saturday and they had four of these for the whole set for that Saturday. And you could buy just one of the experiences or you could package them all up and, and basically have a brewery tour virtually. Um, I, I thought that was really creative and a great way to get, you know, several breweries together, working together to continue to keep New York State breweries top of mind, to continue to be able to serve their uh, craft beer fans. And I know several people just because I live in New York State and I see it, you know, I see it on social media that participated in the social, you know, the sharing and uh, the support that you saw for the local was just incredible. Wow. Wow. That is such a great idea. I mean, the, the great thing about it is they found a way to do something virtually that you cannot do virtually. You cannot right. taste beer <laughs> virtually, right? And yet they figured out a way to, to turn it into a show, send the beers to anyone that, that buys tickets. And now you're banking on the fact that, hey, if you have a good product, these people are going to want to come back and try it again in person. So you're also set, planting the seed for revenue down the road. I think that's a great idea yeah, that these yeah, breweries have put together. that was a great one. And then I have a couple others to share with you. They aren't necessarily the co-opetition or collaboration example, but I thought they were worth um, mentioning. And another example, uh, yes. National Comedy Center, which is located in Jamestown, New York, which is uh, a little bit west of Buffalo, kind of between Buffalo and say Cleveland, real close to Ohio. And they started something called the National Comedy Center Anywhere. And it was a virtual offer where you could access a lot of their content that they have at the Comedy Center thinking, you know, think about we're in such a stressful time. So what a perfect offering to be able to offer laughter and comedy up. And you could access uh, a lot of the content for free, but then they had an upgraded pass 
where you could get even more content uh, that was gated. But if you bought the upgraded pass, it actually came with a ticket so that when the, when the museum reopens, you can actually go and visit. And so they took a virtual experience and tied it to an actual physical ticket for a future visit. And I thought that was very creative as well. I love it. I love it. You, you said you had a couple. What's the other one? Well, Visit Rochester, they put together these, uh, and in Rochester, our airport code is ROC, so ROC. So ROC is kind of okay. our, you know, that's our hashtag. And so they created these ROC scavenger hunts, and they were themed for school subjects. And actually, I did one with my kids for, uh, they picked art and music. So they had an art and music, history, STEM, uh, physical education. And basically with these scavenger hunts, it was, they would describe these things within the city, within that theme, and you would drive around with your kids and find them and take pictures. And they were things that you could do from your car or in a social distancing way. Um, and what I loved about that is that they aligned it with, you know, what the kids were needing to do now at home because everyone's being homeschooled. So I thought that was also a really creative uh, way to to put something together to serve the community and to still keep all of their attractions in mind. And when I saw them put that together, I thought to myself, who better to do that than the DMO? What other organization in a city knows where all of these things would be and would be able to tie them together in an itinerary or in a scavenger hunt in that way? Yes. And the thing that I'm hearing that's consistent in all of these examples that you're sharing and and really what I've seen in, in some of the examples that I've shared previously on the show as well is people are creating assets. Like I'm going to go back to the brewery example and even visit Rochester here in this situation. They're creating assets that can be used after the crisis. So now you've got innovation that in a lot of cases is evergreen and is just another and another innovative way to continue to build the brand of your destination or in the brewery's case of the the association of breweries and each individual brewery as a result. I mean, none of these events or, or extra work that people are working on has to stop when this crisis is over, right? Exactly. And I, I think that's such a great point because the, a lot of these virtual experiences, I believe, will live on beyond you know the pandemic, beyond social distancing. And to your point, it just enhances uh, the marketing assets really that these destinations or museums or associations have uh, in their toolbox to engage and to extend, you know, their message. So I, I think that's such a great point and that people should be thinking about that. What have you created during the crisis that you can continue and that will actually help enhance and, and serve your visitor um, in a new way? Yeah, I would be devastated to see a lot of these amazing and innovative assets that have been created be abandoned when travel comes back to normal. You know, there was there was so much talk of over tourism, and I'm not saying over tourism isn't a thing, uh, but in a lot of cases you had more of a traffic distribution issue than an over tourism issue. It depends on the location. But I would hate to see people abandon some of the scrappy things that I and innovation that I've seen over the last couple of months when the travel industry recovers. Like I'd like to see that same scrappiness continue over time. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's what's going to have to happen in, in the short term for sure, even as we do recover because uh, budgets have been hit so hard that the scrappiness can't go away. No, no, it can't. Well, we've talked about some of the good things that you've seen, uh, and you don't have to name names on this one. We can keep this a little bit general, but tell me some of the mistakes that you're seeing out there. Well, this actually comes back to something we talked about earlier, and that is mindset. And I've seen organizations and companies who have, who are still in crisis mode. They're frozen. They haven't come out yet of what do I do now or, or how do I respond or, or what do I do next? And I talk about this with my team a lot. We are leaning in as a team at my agency into forward thinking mindset. That's We've been saying it since basically the first day that this happened and I had that first team meeting. And, you know, it's the difference between being a short-term kind of finite thinker versus a long-term 
forward, infinite thinker. And I think that that mindset is really the key. If you can't shift your mindset, you're not going to have forward forward movement. And for those destinations or organizations that are stuck there, and and I even look to organizations outside of tourism, and I'll, I'll give you actually a for example, my hairstylist, she had to close, uh, of course, because they all closed. And she was like, I can't stay in upstate New York and have to be, you know, quarantined. So I am going to I'm going south, somewhere sunny. If I have to be by myself, it has to be sunny. And she took off. Well, I'm friends with her on Facebook. I've been going to her for 15 years. Meanwhile, you know, my hair is growing. I have, you may not be able to relate to this, but gray hair, you know, and (laughs) she's gone. (laughs) So uh, friends of mine have hairstylists who are still here who came up with like color to go kits and who are giving, you know, advice on how to take care of your own hair when you can't go to a hairstylist. So, I mean, it's a little thing, but I look at at that and I think you kind of deserted your customers, right? I understand like personally you had to do what you have to do and that's fine. But for people who are in that kind of, you know, flight mode, really. That's what she was in, flight mode. She's out of here. She just can't be quarantined all by herself. And uh, rather than thinking about how can I serve my customers or my visitors, you know, et cetera. And so I think that that to me is the biggest mistake is not having that forward thinking mindset, that mindset of, you know, when the crisis started, we've been in crisis before, we've gotten out of it before. Not my first choice to go through a crisis, but I don't get to pick. So, you know, I only get to pick how I react to it. Yeah, I love the forward thinking mentality, uh, how, how you articulate that there, because, you know, you look at this crisis and, and if you were to ask me before coronavirus hit, what's the worst that could happen? I think I would have described a situation that's identical to the coronavirus situation, right? As far as what's the worst thing that could happen to the tourism industry, but now as an individual destination, if I'm frozen and, and, and I'm not taking action, you know, one of the reasons that scares me is now might be the very best time in the industry, or at least in the last 10 years of the industry, for trial and error. Because if you try something you've never done before and you ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? It's already happened. So, so like the, the risk of, of taking a chance has kind of gone away. But the opportunity for reward of trying something you haven't done before, of taking a risk, is so much higher than the bottom because we're already in the bottom, (laughs) you know? And so if if you think about it like that, that forward thinking mentality of, come on, let's move, let's do something, let's take action, I I really think that's going to be valuable for for any of our destinations that are listening. Yeah, that's such a good point, too. People are definitely a lot more relaxed uh, with their expectations, right? So you put out a virtual experience and it's new to everyone. So people's expectations are, you know, a lot more accepting. Just think about all the Zoom meetings we've been on. And, you know, it used to be like if you're going to work from home, you know, your cat couldn't be walking across your keyboard or something. Right. But now because we're all temporarily working from home, you know, people are a lot more patient with that kind of a thing. And so that's just a really great point. Now is a good time to be taking those risks and trying new things. Um, and that people are a lot more forgiving right now for it, and they will recognize you for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Nicole, we need to go kind of rapid fire here. We, yeah. You and I are having too much fun, I think. <laughs> uh, and, and for the length of the episode, we probably need to go a little rapid fire on the next questions, but I want to make sure we get your answers to these questions. So okay. uh, the first thing I want to ask is, what does the next few months look like for tourism in your eyes? Yes, I I agree with what most of the experts are saying, and that is that we're going to see, you know, local people moving locally first, then regionally, then more longer haul trips. Um, You know, I I think it's going to be next spring before we get into a new normal where there's a lot of movement again. And I think just to tie out what we were just talking about, that the destinations who were most active during this crisis will see a faster rebound. Great, great. Okay. And then if I'm as a destination trying to decide how to prioritize, what should the top maybe three priorities be for any destination right now? 
collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now's the Did time you want to quickly it. expound there? <laughs> uh, well, just, you know, it's so interesting to me because this whole crisis, people are, you know, saying it, it's overplayed. We're in this together. We're in this together. But the truth is, if there were ever a time to really understand that we're in this together, this is the time. It's so obvious that we're in this together. So why aren't we collaborating more? And so I just think that now is the time to really lean into figuring out some really strong collaborations to help you get out. Great, great. I love that that's kind of your platform. I, I, I think that's such a such a great platform to have of, of collaboration. Uh, what about thought leaders in the industry? Who, who are you following right now? I'm following uh, probably many of the same ones that you are, you know, Longwoods International and their uh, weekly travel sentiment study that they do, um, Destination Analysts, Adara, Destinations International, U.S. Travel. I mean, the list goes on and on. There are just so many uh, that are putting out really good content right now. But the other thing that I do is I follow, um, you know, a lot of the local communities, state and the states in terms of what they're putting out for reopening and what they're saying. So trying to really pull together the industry research, but then also what's happening on the, you know, on the health side, what's happening at the state levels to kind of get a real understanding for, for what's, what's going on and where we're going. Great. Great. Um, and then my last question, uh, well, I've got a couple of other questions, but my last rapid fire question, let's put it that way, uh, is other than collaboration, what do you feel like is the most important piece of advice you could give a destination right now? You're going to love this one too. And it's not going to be a surprise. Adopt a forward thinking mindset. It's a must have. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, what's next for you and your business and your podcast? We right now are working on planning our third uh, destination on the left virtual summit. I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but we've held uh, two previously. It was kind of an evolution of the podcast. Last December, we hosted our very first virtual summit. We had 15 presenters. Uh, they were all previous podcast guests. And um, it was very successful. So we planned and held one for April uh, of this year, uh, a second one, and we are planning our third for the fall. So I'm excited about that. Um, it's a really great, great way to offer more knowledge and for our audience to gain, uh, you know, access to the people that, that we interview on the podcast. So that's one thing. The other is we just recently launched an online course and it's for strategic marketing planning uh, for a post-pandemic recovery. It's basically a DIY, uh, do it yourself. We, we took our entire process and that we do just as we would train it to one of our new employees. And we put it into an online course, uh, seven modules with homework. And there's some coaching that's involved uh, with that as well. So we're excited about that uh, as well. I love that. So how do, how do we get to that? Is, or that, are you about to on our website at breaktheicemedia.com. And there's actually a banner right across the top of the website that'll take you right to that landing page. Perfect. Perfect. And tell me, uh, as far as the podcast goes, where can people find Destination on the Left? Destination on the Left is also on our website, but it can also be found anywhere that you listen to podcasts. We're distributed through um, a service called Libsyn, which gets us everywhere. Google Play, um, iTunes, iHeartMedia, <laughs> Alexa, you know, wherever yeah. you like to listen, we're there. Just look for Destination on the Left. Okay. All right. I like it. And then my last question that I like to close with is just, is there anything that I haven't asked you, Nicole, that you feel like our audience would, would need or like to hear? Uh, I think I'll just close with, we do also on our website uh, have a resources page. And on that resources page is a webinar that uh, I gave to visit Rochester, but we recorded it and, and put it there. And basically what that was, was the result of my team going through all of the research that we had received, which is a lot, both from the tourism industry, as well as from outside of the industry and coalescing it into, you know, a uh, presentation 
on marketing your way through a crisis. And um, you will see information in there on mindset. <laughs> You'll see that for sure. But then we also offer up quite a few kind of tactical things that destinations and tourism organizations can be doing now and doing themselves um, as they're planning to come out to come out of this. So I would encourage you to check that out also on our website. It's in the resources section and uh, you'll find a lot of links there as well. Great. Okay. Go check out the webinars. I'm going to go check it out immediately following this interview here. Uh, Nicole, it sure has been great to have you today and thanks so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge and, and doing a little co opetition with me here. Yeah, I love it. We're, we're co-opters. <laughs> co-opters, is that right? That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. good stuff. I, I really enjoyed it today, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. This has been another great episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. Uh, if you haven't yet joined the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group, make sure you do that. Uh, I'm going to share the link to this webinar that Nicole talked about today in the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group. Uh, also, if you haven't yet joined the Slack channel, uh, we're getting all the Destination Marketers uh, onto a Slack channel where we can collaborate, share information, um, and we'll post the episodes that we do here, but also any of the tangible content that, that you would normally see in the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group will also be posted in the Slack channel. So we'll take care of that uh, following this episode. If you want to be uh, added to the Slack channel, just email me at adam at relicagency.com and I'll get you added to that Slack channel. We're, all, we're already having a lot of fun. Uh, thanks, everybody, and have a great week.